Decided this year that this would be a surprise for Christmas that you can get something else, and I hope you like it. And this is going to be family history from way back, like to 1911. And I thought maybe you might like to hear some of those little old folklore, or whatever you want to call it, that happened years ago. And I'm around here to tell you. So, what do you want to hear? I was born and. 1911 and a little log house that my parents had moved into in 1906 when they were married and four of us we were all born there and uh, then we moved into a, another house when I was four years old it was a big event because it was a big frame house and I thought it was the biggest house I'd ever seen and I can remember the moving, and I carried over the kitchen chairs. I think it was more or less to get out of the way that they let me carry over a chair or two. <laughs> and we got into this big house with big rooms and all that, and it's still there. And my nephew, Reg Weatherill, still lives in the same place. And I'm really pleased about that, because the name was named Weatherill Road after us. So if you ever go out to visit there, you'll find that there's this Weatherill Road that you can stop and know where you are. There was one of our neighbors who was a school teacher and she thought it was quite interesting, my dad's career there, that he came from Dakota and uh, settled there on a homestead. And then she called, wrote an article for the farm paper and it was called From the Log Cabin to the White House in 10 Years. And that was kind of funny, the way she had it written up. I don't know where it is now. But anyway, they did quite well. And uh, one of the things that we had to do was learn to ride horseback before we went to school, because if you didn't, you wouldn't get any education. So I became quite a good horseback rider by the time I was school age. And I kept on riding till I was in grade eight. And then we had to leave home to go to school after that. So I went to the convent in Red Deer. I got piano lessons in high school there. And that was great years. I have very fond memories of the year I spent in Red Deer and I still keep in, in touch with one of the girls that went there. My mother came from Nebraska and before they left Nebraska they had a big family picture for them and there, and there is a picture of that taken when they uh, beside a lake and uh, that is here with all the cousins and everybody giving them quite a send-off. And then the next year when they got on the their homestead, they all got together to have a, the ones who came had a celebration of all their arrivals because they came from Wisconsin and Nebraska mostly. And that's why the Nebraska school is named Nebraska because half of them came on a wagon train from Nebraska and my parents came on what they call an immigration train from the railroad where they had a, a stove in the last car and everybody could go back there and cook their own meals. It was sort of like camping. And they had their own food along, and they could cook their meals in there, and there was a wash tub, and they could wash their clothes and dry them in the wind, I guess, or whatever, I don't know. But they got their <laughs> washing done, and their cooking all done in this immigration train, and they didn't have to leave the train till they got to Panoka. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to pronounce that name. They called it Panica when they were in the States, but they learned it was supposed to be Panoka after they got there. <laughs> And uh, my dad came from Madison, South Dakota. And he came up on a, another train, but then he met my mother when they were there. And uh, they were married in 1906 when she was 16. It was kind of a young age to get married, but it worked out all right. And uh, that was the year that this picture was taken to the cabin was when they got married. Before they left the States, they had the map all out, and they knew that they were coming to Panica, and then they were going to somewhere near the Asinobia River, <laughs> which they found out, of course, was the Assiniboia, <laughs> but it was all for a good laugh. And then at that first picnic that they came out, they were straight from the America, so they sang, My Country, Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty. 
And then there was a school teacher there that got up and made a little speech and he told them that he hoped that they would adapt to their new country and learn old Canada. <laughs> <laughs> And there was always these funny little things that happened because they were truly Americans when they left the States, but they soon adapted and learned that you're saying God save the Queen and all these, or the King, or whichever happened to be ruling at the time. Victoria was in there, so they had to change twice from Victoria to George back to Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> My great grandmother came over from Ireland and her name was Catherine Gallagher, and she was born in Cork. And she was the oldest of nine children, and she was only 11 years old. And uh, they didn't have much money. It was during the potato famine, but their neighbors got enough money together so that they came over. And the family said, well, they'd let Katie go because she was the oldest in the family, and that would give her a chance, and they'd come the next year. So Katie worked as a housemaid from the time she was 11 in Boston until she was 16 and she got married. And they, they never heard from their folks, so they assumed that they had was in the potato famine and they never made it. Anyway, it was kind of a sad time for Katie. She got married and lived to Wisconsin. She was a very staunch Catholic. She must have been, because only 11 years old, she kept her religion and she married someone that was her husband was Bill Kane and he wasn't a Catholic. But anyway, she, seeing that they all got to church and all that sort of thing, and uh, and she married my grandfather who was a, a widow, widower with three children. That was Rose and Lottie and Dan Gardner. And there was three in the family first and then my mother and Art Gardner and Hazel were in the second family, so that was Oh, that's and then when Rose and Art Gardner got married, they decided they were coming up to the new country, and they just got married and came out there for a honeymoon. I don't know what kind of a honeymoon it was, because they had to live in the tent the first summer till they got their log cabin. And they wrote back and told my folks in Wisconsin what a wonderful country it was. There was all the fish in the lake and the prairie chickens and wild, while you could just eat off the land. And it was such a glowing account that they all packed up the whole family, the brothers and sisters and everybody, and moved out. From Laval? From Laval, Wisconsin. And there were supposed to be schools and churches and everything, but there was nothing but brush and lakes, <laughs> and all these fish in the lakes that they told about. <laughs> anyway, they put up a, a little log house that first summer, and they managed with a tent and all that, and they got into them. They all thought it was fun. They made a little loft up there where the children slept up in the top of the cabin. And the next summer they built a frame house that was there for years and years afterwards. So then there was, uh, that was the Gardner family was established there. And my dad came up on his own at the same time. And then his sister, uh, uh, Laura and Elmer Cheever got married in 1903, and they moved up there. And they moved out to my dad's cabin, and never, nobody locked their doors, so they went in, and my, my aunt said, well, this can't be a bachelor because it's too clean in here. She says, I'm sure we got the wrong house, but they found out it was my dad's log cabin, but he was a pretty good housekeeper. <laughs> so they stayed. So that meant that the gardeners and the weatherals were kind of established in that neighborhood. And they built the Rutherford School in 1905. And uh, that was all the pioneers. The pioneers got together and built the school, and then they built the one in Nebraska was really the year before. And my mother went to that one for one year, I think. She went to school in Nebraska. She was 12. But she didn't go to Rutherford. She started working out. Then she got married when she was 16. She didn't have too much time to go to school. <laughs> so far I've been talking about my folks coming from Dakota and Wisconsin, but Lawrence's folks, they came from Iowa, and they came up on a covered wagon train, and they had five covered wagons, and they all came together, the whole family. And. Uh, the year or two before that, 
his mother and the grandma and grandpa and nice had gone to the Chicago World's Fair and they got their pictures taken and that's how we happen to have these old pictures of them was taken at the World's Fair sometime in the 1980s but if anybody looks up in history that I've seen it in history books where the World's Fair in Chicago was at that time and that was really quite an event for them to be able to go to the World's Fair with a team and buggy and drive from Iowa to Washington so Park in Chicago. Yeah. Grandma Lund always used to talk about her mother coming home and telling about the fair and they had a cow made entirely out of butter from Ontario that was shipped to Chicago and it was packed around with ice and they could look through it with glass and they kept this fresh ice packed around this cow made out of butter to advertise Ontario butter in Chicago. So, Isn't that something? And Grandma thought that, uh, or she said there was so many little tales, and then they had their pictures taken there, which was another great event, because you couldn't get them done in small pictures, yeah. taken in small yeah. towns. Mm -hmm. And we had some very close friends and neighbors that got established at that time, and that was Mr. and Mrs. Sayers. Mrs. Sayers and my mother were very close friends, and they used to go back and forth and do do things for for each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that I can remember Mrs. Sarah did for my mother, she was very, very visiting, she says, I think it's time that I wean Valerie. And she said, well, there will be no problem. I'll just take her home for two or three days, and when she comes back, she'll be weaned. And that's the way it happened. Mm -hmm. and I don't know whether I was, Mrs. Sarah said it was no problem. Of course, I guess she was nice about it. My mom said it was just simple as that. <laughs> Piece of cake, eh? Just like a piece of cake. <laughs> My mother had a cousin called Walter Raybuck, and he they written down told him how wonderful it was, and he was single and unattached, so he came up there and he looked around. When he went back, he thought that rough wilderness is not for him. Mm -hmm. So he went back to Wisconsin, where they came from. But I always kept it. My mother took me back to the States one time, and I got to stay there because he bought their home place in Wisconsin. And I got to sleep in the bedroom that my mother used to sleep in when she was a little girl. Oh, and Walter so. Raybach bought their home place. Oh, and then on that trip I got to Chicago and saw my Aunt Lottie that lived in Chicago and got to Milwaukee. By the time I was eight years old, I was well traveled <laughs> at that time, but not so much in the later years. But uh, how did you get there? By train. We went everywhere by train. And I was eight years old and I was quite big and I can remember Mom said that if, if I was only six years old I could have gone for nothing. But she had to pay half. <laughs> and I was a pretty big eight-year-old and nobody could pretend that I was six. So I had to pay this half fare and that was quite a bit of money at that time too. And my cousin William Gillis, who was just like a brother to me, and he came up and stayed with my grandma and grandpa and helped them so that they didn't have to live alone. So William was a big factor in our life. They were only half a mile from our place. My grandparents, the weather was great. And he still, his, is his wife still in Rome? You no, know, she died two years ago. Like it rained. Because when she used to come over and help my mom sometime, when she would have had too much to do. And uh, I got, I wanted to learn to dance so bad. I think it was only maybe about 10 years old, but there were schoolhouse dances and I couldn't dance because I didn't know how. So Mona taught me to waltz around the kitchen floor and she hummed and whistled and I learned to waltz. <laughs> so the next time we went to a schoolhouse dance, I got to dance. And that was a big milestone in my life when I didn't have to sit and just watch everybody. <laughs> so Mona was a pretty good friend of mine. I never forgot her teaching me to waltz. And, uh, my dad's youngest sister, Annie, came up from Dakota afterwards because she, with her parents, and then she lived with them until she got married to Ed Webster and they moved to Big Valley and we didn't see very much of them when they were in. We used to go back and forth maybe once a year if we were lucky. Mm -hmm. but we always had to go to see the relatives of Big Valley. And mom had some cousins and in Wisconsin that she hated to leave and they were very close friends so after she got up there they sent her pictures of her of themselves when they were all dressed up in their fancy hats and mom cried 
she just prized those pictures so much and she used to take them out and show me Hattie and Cora. And so Hattie and Cora and their big hats was a, a big event. Mom's father came up there. He was the only gardener that came, but he left four brothers behind and they all got married after that. So they sent the picture of the, my grandfather's four brothers and their wives so that they know how they were doing way back in the States at that time when you had to go by train. It was quite a while. One time we went to visit some friends and we had a picture taken of our family. I think that was the first family picture we had after Belford came along. So there was Gordon and me and Basil and Belford and Mom and Dad on the picture. And then one time it was a big event. Dad was uh, on the council and all the municipal councillors got to go to Calgary to a municipal convention. And Mom went along with her friend Mrs. Percy Walters and they took in this big Alberta Farmers Convention in Calgary. And we stayed with Graham. Of course, Graham was always our built-in babysitter and she looked after us while they were away. This old log cabin was really kind of special because most people think of kind of a trapper's cabin, but this had linoleum on the floor and it had, uh, it had a nice wallpaper on the walls and we had pretty good furniture in there. And when I was born there, they even had the telephone in. That came through in 1911 and that was a big thing for those homesteaders out there to have the telephone. So my mother said, when the baby cries the first time, you ring our number and hold the baby up there and then we won't have to announce. So my grandmother held me up to the telephone and I cried good and loud, they said. And they heard click after click after click coming down. And then pretty soon the phone rang and they said, is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> so that was the old fashioned party line. <laughs> in 1911, they still listened in. <laughs> rubber, they rubber. <laughs> <laughs> we moved into the the big white house, as we always referred to it, after living in the little smaller log house, it seemed pretty big. And we had a barn built, that was what they call a native lumber at that time. And my uncle had a sawmill, Art Crown, and they cut down all the trees around in that area where there was enough trees that they could have enough lumber to build that barn all out of native lumber, except the outside siding was store log. And then it was painted. But it was a big barn. It held about 12 or 14 horses and cows and whatever in there. And when I was, uh, this is getting back to that log house again when we moved in there. I know it was June the 4th when we were moving because Margaret Ferguson worked for my mom and helped her with all these carpenters that they had to cook for. And she made me a birthday cake with four layers on it. I still remember she spread jam in between each raspberry jam in between each later and put icing on it. And when the men came in, I showed them this birthday cake and one of the men picked it up and took it out to the bunkhouse and said they were going to eat it. And I can remember crying and pounding on the door, figuring that I literally thought they were going to eat the whole thing. So then they came out and gave it to me and I, we had the cake for supper after all. <laughs> but I thought that, that was gone, for sure. And then my folks went away to the States one time and I had to stay in Lacombe with my Aunt Melora. They were living in Lacombe that time. So they thought it would be nice if they brought Valerie out to Granddad and Grammy's where Basil and Gordon stayed. So they took this picture of Myrtle and Rose and Basil and Gordon and I all out at Granddad's farm. And those are big events on Sunday when Uncle Elmer would get in his old Red Devil, as he called his Buick car, and we'd drive out to Grammy's place and when we get there he'd say we went so fast the telephone poles just looked like teeth in a fine comb <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of agreed to that two of us kids sitting in the back seat the way he tore out there but we always look forward to those Sunday dinners at Grammy's house and we went up to visit some other friends that their names were Sharmans and they lived up north of Basho it was called the Dutch Flats at that time but I don't know why I had my picture taken up at that, that place that day out in their garden. I can remember being at Shireman's for, for dinner. They had a big family and I always liked to go to Shireman's for somebody to play with. 
and when we got married on the 23rd of November, the weather was really quite cold and there was quite a bit of snow. And we drove, the next day we drove all the way to Edmonton. And there was lots of snow on the ground and it was really cold. And it took us from early in the morning, we had to go behind the snow plow because the snow plow would, had to plow the roads out. It stormed that night, all the roads were bad. We got into Edmonton at two o'clock in the morning and the only hotel that we could find was open on Jasper Avenue. It was a Corona Hotel, I can always remember that. It was a big hotel. And we stayed there and... Uh, How much were the rooms? The rooms are two dollars and your dad said, that's quite a bit of money. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we got up here and here they'd given us the bridal room and had big curtains drawn back from the bed and we had a separate bathroom. I never was in such a fancy hotel in my life and I guess they picked us out as being a bride and groom the way we were dressed and everything. <laughs> so we got this beautiful room for two dollars. So the next day we were out looking around and doing some shopping. We saw a place where you could have bed and room and breakfast for 75 cents. So we went to that place <laughs> the next day because two dollars was unspeakable <laughs> sleeping one night in the room. So anyway, we stayed there for a week then and we had our wedding pictures taken. And uh, we did. What, what did you do? Tour toured every second hand store. That was my first initiation <laughs> <laughs> to going to, to second hand stores. And we bought a little bit of furniture. We got a wicker set for our, and I had that for years. I didn't sell it until we came out to BC. I can remember that. The three piece wicker, there was a rocker and there was a little settee and there was a, a chair, three-piece set. And that was our first purchase. Do you remember how much it cost? It cost $25. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was $21. And then there's a story behind that when we had a sale before we left with some things and I got $25 when I sold it. <laughs> and we had our pictures taken up there and there was one good one of me, and there was one good of your dad, so my mom got one of each. Or Lawrence's mother got the best one of him, I think. Uh, and Basil and Betty were married the next year, and they were married in Calgary, and we went down to their wedding, and I was the bridesmaid at their wedding then. And they got moved up, um, and they was two. Who? And this, that was my brother, Basil married Betty from Calgary. And then Gordon married, they were both teachers, Gordon married Mildred and she was also taught at Nebraska school. And uh, she was a very, both very attractive young ladies, school teachers, so it didn't take them long to get taught. And here's Wilfred and Mary. They were married, I, I can't remember exactly the year, but it wasn't. They had Marlene and Claire and then war. Second World War broke out and he went overseas and Mary was home with those two children until he got back. And another kind of interesting thing is about my great grandmother. So this is the picture of my grandmother, Catherine Gallagher. And she was pure Irish. <laughs> As opposed to what? And this is my great-grandmother, and that was on my uh, granddad Wetherill's mother, so that's my, I have two great-grandmothers. One was with the, one whose name was Annie Meek, and the other was Annie Smith, and she was Wetherill. They were sisters in law those two ladies are. And then I have a, a picture of taken in Wisconsin of the Gardner family. I guess they thought there was probably not too many photographers in Canada, so they had their picture taken together when they were, before they left. And there's my Aunt Rose and Uncle Dan on the back. Aunt Rose was a teacher, and Dan later became a chiropractor. What did they no, call? no, he wasn't a chiropractor. I made a mistake there. He was a minister. 
And then my grandmother, and my grandfather, and my Aunt Lottie lived in Chicago. She was a stenographer and she never married. And then there's my mother and Hazel and Art Gardner. When he was the one that became a chiropractor, doctor later on. You know what it is like in the farm when people come over on Sundays and this goes on and on. And we used to have neighbors, Ed and Reith Westling and my uncle and the gardeners and crowns. We used to get together often for Sunday dinners. I think that's generally the way. And my grandma was always there. And she really liked my youngest brother. She kind of spoiled him, but that didn't hurt him a bit. And one time she always told me that when I was two years old, we just lived a half a mile apart. And Grandma used to love to tell the story about me running away from home. My first time I ran away from home, I guess I was two. <laughs> and I went up to her place and she saw me coming in the yard. And she said, I couldn't talk plain, but I said, I come my own telf. And she said she knew that, but I told her that all the way to the house. And then she just put me to bed that night. And she thought, well, they'll know where she is. And about, my dad came in for supper, Mom said, and he says, where's Valerie? And she says, oh, I imagine that she just went up to Mother's place. And he says, you imagine that? And so she said she had to cook supper and had all these men coming in. She couldn't go out looking for me. So she said she got into bed that night and she couldn't go to sleep. So she got up and walked up to my grandmother's house. And there I was, sound asleep in bed. And it was all right anyway, but she had to make sure. It was a half a mile away, so that was a mile my mother walked at 11 o'clock at night to make sure. <laughs> And she could have phoned, but my grandmother didn't have a phone in her house. I don't know why they didn't have one for them. So we would have had all these messages when they had to have been taken by carrier, as I did. <laughs> this is an and, uh, This one here, Mom. That my mom had a lot of, as I mentioned before, cousins that she left in the States. She was very fond of. And this is. Her cousin Isabel, and I don't remember her husband's name, but she always thought a lot of Isabel, and they used to write. And when I went back to the States on that famous trip, I saw Isabel, too. And I always liked or talked about the Cheegers a lot, my Aunt Malora and Uncle Elmer, and their two children were Rose and Myrtle, which I kept in touch with Rose yet. She's the crochet hermit. But anyway, that's her parents. And my grandmother was a wonderful dressmaker, and she made the dress that my aunt is wearing at that time. And uh, she was kind of slow about her sewing. We all knew that, too. And my aunt was so annoyed, she didn't get her dress done until the morning she'd be married. And she said if she'd had another decent rag to wear, she wouldn't have worn that wedding dress because she, her mother was sewing the last braid on it as she was going out the door. <laughs> But anyway, it was a beautiful dress and it was all finished and the picture shows that it was really a pretty dress. What color was it? And it was a kind of a gray, sock, dumb gray they called it. Mm. Anyway, it was all that braid that Grandma had sewed on it, made for a good... And the Wetherills was always, they seemed to get pictures taken when they left someplace and when they came back. My dad was 21 when he came up to Canada to Homestead, so he got his picture taken in Dakota just before he left, and that's my dad when he was 21. When my mom and dad got married, were going to get married, my Aunt Laura was already out there. She came out in 1903, as I said, the Cheevers did. And they lived near there, and she was also a good sewer, so when mom was going to get married at 16, they decided that she would make her a wedding dress for her. So she fixed it all up really fancy with braid, and all had the watch, and she had the watch that her mother had on. And they went into Penelope on a, on a Saturday, and they were going to, they decided that they would uh, get married, find out about getting married anyway. So they went to town, and the priest said he was leaving the next morning at 8 o'clock. They either have to get married that night or the next morning or he wouldn't be back for three weeks because he was going to Rocky Mountain House for a mission. So they decided, well, then, they might as well get married then. My mother said her wedding dress was 20 miles out in the country, but they got married in her whatever she wore. I don't know what she wore, but she, she got married in whatever she had on. 
And then they finally, they got back and told them all that they were married that night. And they had the wedding party then was planned for the day that they were supposed to get married on a Wednesday. And that was about five days later. So they had the dance and the dinner and everything at their house. She Fine. got to wear a new dress. I she think. got to wear a wedding dress, but she said it never seemed like her wedding dress because she wasn't married in it. Mm -hmm. And she said she didn't know why she called it her wedding dress because she wasn't married in it, but she did get her picture taken in it. So but it was made for the wedding. It was made for yeah. the wedding. Do you remember the color or who made it? It was navy blue and, mm -hmm. and uh, Laura made it. And then when I was nine months old, they decided they'd get our family picture taken for Christmas presents. So I was born in June, so I was my oldest. And I was about nine months old, I guess. Anyway, it was a big deal to get your picture taken because they had to drive into Tees and put their team and rig, in, as they called it, in the livery barn mm. and then catch the train and then drive, go on the train into Lacombe and stay there overnight and then come back and go mm. home the next day. So Basil always did like to cut hair pretty good and Gordon had long curly hair. It was something like Doug Bolton's, I think, because it was just a mass of curls that hung down to his shoulders. And Mom says, well, we're going to have the family picture taken while Gordon still has his nice curls. So they went through all this rigmarole and got into Lacombe and the photographer was in Red Deer taking pictures that day. And they hadn't made any <laughs> arrangements. They just figured the photographer would be there. So they had to come home. So Basil thought, well, we've been there and had the picture taken, and Mom said they were really quiet in the in the bedroom, and she said she could still see Basil was sitting on the bed, and he had Gordon between his knees, and he had the scissors out, and he'd cut all his hair off. <laughs> Mom said as soon as the picture was taken, she was going to have Gordon's curls cut, but not before. So, so anyway, we laughed about it a good many times, and Gordon said that was the best thing that Basil ever did for him, was cut off all <laughs> all those curls. <laughs> and so they kind of straightened it up a little bit and a few days later, I don't know whether it was a week or so later, they got the arrangements made and got in and got the picture taken and got home again. But it was a long story. <laughs> and Mom still had the gold watch on that she had the day she was married. I think it's a different dress. Looks a little bit different than her. She must have got a new dress for that. And, and where did that watch come from? That was my her mother's watch, and she gave it to her the day she was married for her wedding present. Where did her mother get it from? Her mother got some inheritance money, and she built a new house and bought herself an Elgin watch down in the States. Oh. And that's the house that they sold when they came up to Canada, and they had a little bit of money when they came to Canada, because they had a new house on their farm down there. But that was the reason why she had that watch, was because she inherited this money from this Catherine Gallagher and William Kane died. They left a certain amount of oh. money to each one of their children. Mm -hmm. So they must have prospered along the way somewhere down mm -hmm. Wisconsin. And does it open that watch? Mm-hmm. And it, it's opened and uh, Sharon has that watch and now she has Stephanie's name engraved in the the inside of it, mm -hmm. on the inside so it's got her name on it and my mother's and my grandmother's and my great grandmother's is all engraved oh, on the inside yeah. of that watch. I didn't know that. And uh, that was. And later on, much, much later on, my folks went to Vancouver one time and they went there for Christmas for a holiday and they were gone through Christmas. So they sent us a picture of them so we could see what they looked like at Christmas anyway when we were. And uh, Mom was sick at that time, but she still had that thick, curly hair. It was dark brown. And Michelle's hair is just as curly as Mom's was, and just as thick, too. And I tell her she's like her great-grandmother. And anyway, that picture was taken. In. And, and where did you stay then when they went to Vancouver? Well, we were all married at that time. Oh. That, that was about two years before my mother, about three years before my mother died. Oh, mm -hmm. She died of a heart attack. So, but your folks used to go on trips? Oh, they went on trips to Vancouver quite often and left us home to hold the fort. We went to all the dances in the country while they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we all 
they had a pretty good time because there was always a dance and they happened to be three schoolhouses right close to where we were besides the dances and teas. That was our only entertainment. We didn't get to go to shows. There were no shows out in that area. And everybody learned to dance in the kitchen. <laughs> I wasn't good enough to play at the dances. We had somebody by the name of Babe Lawson that could just play anything. And he could play for a dance without any accompaniment. Oh. But he, he didn't like to do that. One time the Nices all decided that they were going to have a reunion. That was the first reunion I was ever at. And there was um, taken down at Haunted Lake. That was, a, that was kind of an interesting name. And the Syberts lived at Haunted Lake and had that big old house. And Lou Minkler from Lacombe, he kind of organized the thing. And we all got there, but they were playing ball. And the worst of it is they could never get everybody together. And they decided to take the pictures, and there was nobody there but women. The rest of the boys, and most of them, Catherine, and a lot of the girls were all playing ball. So that's why Catherine and all the boys and some of the girls are not on that picture because they said they didn't know or else they'd rather play ball. I never knew which. But I'm standing up at the back there holding Faye as a baby right in the middle of the top. And my mother is on the front row standing near the, the left and Grandma Lund is beside her. I don't know how long my folks have been married, but I was only two anyway. They decided to go over and see George and Bertha Nice because they were old friends before any of them got married. And they went over and uh, my dad and mom were standing in the back row and dad has a plug hat on there. Mom wanted me to sit down in the front with all the other kids, but I wanted to stand back where she was, so I wasn't too happy about that. But I don't remember that. She just told me about it. I was stubborn and wouldn't sit down in the grass with the other kids, but I didn't know any of them. But anyway, there's both sides of the family are on that picture. And Lawrence is in the second row to the right. And George is right in, and Thelma right in front of him. The rest of them are mostly cousins. Phyllis is there too. And this is a, taken way back in England when my granddad Wetherill had a, a brother who was a tailor and he had one foot that had been injured in war or something and he couldn't walk very well but he was a tailor and he made my dad a suit and sent it over to to send his measurements clear to England and his suit made. Mm -hmm. That's my dad's uncle. Uncle Bob was his name. My grandparents, when they first came out from Wisconsin, they built a little log house the first year, just a one room log house. And they lived in that till they got their big frame house. This was built all out of lumber. And it was quite a nice house with Two, bed, two rooms, a kitchen, a living room downstairs, and there was three bedrooms upstairs. And that stood for years and years, but it's I didn't there the last time I went out. There's a big field all over their place, and there's no more buildings left on it. And that was about 1902 when that house was built. And then when we were married, we had a, quite a big wedding at our place, and it was there was no flash cameras, so we all went outside that day, even though it was cold and there was snow on the ground. And all the men stood in front, and all the men, women at the back and on the porch and on the veranda. So you can hardly even see the bride. But I'm in there somewhere. That was the 23rd of November, 1931. And uh, the dinner was in our home. They had a big table set up in the living room and in the dining room both. There was 112 people there that day that had dinner or supper, whichever way you want to call it. They, were, they had settings? like Yeah, different settings, about three or four settings before they all got through. It ran into from noon till supper time, no matter whether you call it dinner or supper, that's when it ran into it. So... And who did, who did the cooking? Oh, Mrs. DeLue was in charge of the kitchen, and then there was uh, far, the neighbors and the ladies all volunteered. And they missed the wedding, those that volunteered to help do the cooking, too. So that was kind of too bad that they couldn't be yeah. cooking. Where were you married? We were married up at Manford Church, which was about 15 miles north, east of, or northeast, north of Basham. Oh, yeah. That was the country church before they had one in Basham. 
And that one's taken down now, it isn't there anymore. What did you have for your wedding dinner? Well, we had a traditional Christmas dinner, turkey and dressing. And I think we had banana cream pie for dessert and wedding cake also. Mm. So all the neighbors cooked the turkey and then they brought them over that morning before the wedding. And then it was a kind of a community fair like everything was, small weddings then. Everybody pitched in and helped. And Wash dishes for us. And the boys and the young boys and the girls all got out in the kitchen and washed dishes and they seemed to all be having a lot of fun out there. And pretty soon it was all over and I didn't have much to do with that part of it. So after um, we came to Penticton, we decided we'd, be to, we'd do like the rest of the people. We'd get a family picture taken and send it back to Alberta. So that was when uh, Bill was a, Bill was the youngest of the family anyway. And you were expecting? I was expecting Ted. But I don't know. We just decided we'd have a picture taken then anyway. So there it is. Everybody's on that and that. There was nobody married in the family yet. The next time we had our family picture taken, I think it was later on. Well, this is when we were married. The next time was when we were married, what was it? 50. 50 years. And that's kind of self. No, 55 this one. 55 years. That's right. Yeah. And everybody knows everybody on there, I think. I don't have to explain who to. It was taken in Larry's yard. It was in a really nice setting back in there. And this is some of the oldest hi history that we have. And it's quite interesting to me because Lawrence's mother, Grandma, told me about that her mother and dad had this picture hanging on their bedroom wall and it was prized very much. And then she said they gave it to Kate and Kate Newinger had it, and then Kate gave it to Madeline. And Madeline Schultz, that's Catherine's third daughter, had it. And I said, well, I really would like to see that again. And she said, well, you don't worry, I'll take it home, I'll take it out of the frame, and I'll go down and have a photo statted off for you, because Grandma Lunda told her that that was a very important picture, it had been handed down in their family that she didn't know how long. So I got a, a German lady, Madame Yanni, she lived across the street from me and could read English and German both. And she told me that whoever got that paper or had that picture was, must have been somebody quite important because there was only a few that had that. So I got found out that Pope Leo X was the one that gave those pictures out. And some one of our ancestors way, way back had been invited Turin, where that shroud is, and they were invited and got one and brought it home. And that's been handed down in the nice family in Germany since that date. And now Madeline's got the original copy. And when we came, when my parents first came from Nebraska, it was 1902. And uh, they came in 1901, but the next summer in 1902, they decided that they would all, the new homesteaders would get a, get together and have a picnic, and they all brought lunch. And they even hired the band from Pinoca to come over and play the music for the, and the Nebraska school was just about half built. It wasn't quite finished at that time, but they were going to have the, the schoolhouse done by before winter. And my mom and dad are on that picture. My dad's in the back row standing there with a, to the left. And uh, the rest of the people are all friends and neighbors. It's pretty hard to describe everybody, but my grandparents are on there. I was telling you before about when we moved out of the log house when I was four years old. And that was a big event. And uh, we moved into our new house. And uh, that was in 1915. And the war was on, and it was really hard to get help. But anyway, they got enough help to build that house. Most of the carpenters came from Calgary. We had a phone in the house, and I remember my dad would say, well, I'll have to phone down to Calgary. 
and see if I can get another man to come up here and help because they take the train from Calgary and they'd go to Tees and get this help that came because none of the farmers around there knew how to, they had to laugh and plaster and that's what they call drywall now. But the house was all finished up that summer. And we got moved into it in July because they were doing the moving in June on my birthday, but I think they got all the linoleums down and the furniture all in. We bought new furniture. It was quite a big affair when we moved into that new house with four bedrooms upstairs and one down. And uh, then, you know. Was it painted or wallpapered? Uh, the walls were all painted and the floors were varnished and then they had linoleum in the kitchen and in the middle of the room and a rug in the middle of the front room. And they had a library table in the middle. <laughs> you don't hear library tables anymore, but that's what it was. And everybody had coal oil lamps. There wasn't any plumbing or electricity in the house. We had to have a lamp for each room. And that was one job that I didn't like, was filling those lamps with coal oil, and washing those chimneys and polishing them, because that was a daily job. It seemed like as if the chimneys wouldn't last two days in the wintertime when they were on a long time. And then there's another time that my mother said before they left to come up to this new country, they, they were supposed to have confirmation. It just happened the year before they left. So she's on that picture, and so is Art Gardner. And my mom's standing right between the bishop and the priest at the right-hand corner with her veil on, and she was about I think 12 or 13 at that time. And that's their old parish church. And they had a dinner after that confirmation. She told me at the church too. All well, these dinners seemed to be things that went on and on. My parents lived in Wisconsin where there was either Irish Catholics or there were a lot of German Lutherans and they all had good times together and all went to church. And they had a, a big gathering and this is one of their gatherings where they had a keg of beer. And if you look closely in there, you can see the keg of beer with the people standing around. But I can't recognize any of my relatives. I think there was mostly neighbors. And if my relatives were there, they were in the house, I think. Or flat out. Or <laughs> probably passed out. <laughs> <laughs> but that was taken in Wisconsin anyway. And this was... Another picture that was taken of the family, this was mostly relatives, and they had a big picnic at a lake in Wisconsin, and all the relatives seemed to turn out. And they also had a band there. They were very popular getting the band to come and play for these big celebrations. So they had, and that's mom's cousin Isabel on the corner. She had a very pretty dress and hat on, so they had her stand up in one corner so that would be noticed. And, Walter Raybuck, another cousin, is standing out in front there. He was one that came to Alberta and turned around and went back. He didn't like the homesteading. Hmm. This is another family gathering that was quite important when Byron Crowns came down from up in Winfield where they had an orchard and we had roses out from Alberta and we decided to have a, a picnic at the lake and all the crowns and all the lungs are on there together. And you'll be able to pick them out, I think, as you see them. There's Aunt Rose's on there. I think I took the picture, so Dad, my dad's on there. And Faye's holding Bubs when it was the baby there. So And then just uh it was Sharon's first communion day and she thought that, that celebration was put on because it was her first communion and that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and homeless. Crowns have always been a very close part of our family. And, and I was just up to their 65th wedding anniversary. And Rosemary and Frank and Faye went along. And we saw the whole family was there and we had quite a get together. And we even talked about this picture together, saying that Dot Henny was on that picture and she was also at their 65th and she isn't even a relative, so that shows how we've all kept in touch. And uh, they are in Byron were pretty well. And when, when Tracy and Herb Lund were first married, 
they lived in Calgary, and he worked at the Calgary Sash and Door Factory, which was there for years and years. I don't know whether it still is, but it was there for at least 50 years. And he worked there making doors and windows, and that was his trade, and they lived in Valentine Nice's little house that he had built in Calgary when he first came to that country. And then after a while, he walked, walked, went up to Lamberton and got a homestead and started farming, but he was living in Calgary before the turn of the century. And they lived in his house until yeah. after Lawrence was born, and then they moved up to Alberta, and they got a homestead also. And that's where George was born on the homestead, so they grew up in that farm was there for many years. That was brought up in the covered wagon, because the youngest of the Nice family all wore that dress, and then Lawrence was the first of the next generation that wore it. Wore it. Oh. And Kate told me that Dora and Pete and Gusta were all baptized in that dress. So who made the dress originally, do you know? It was a dressmaker that made it. In those mm -hmm. days, everybody had a dressmaker because mm -hmm. everything was handmade. But I didn't know that until Kate Newinger told me that when I had out. And she says, I said, all of my children are baptized. And she says, that's not all. She said, Kate and Dora and Pete, that's the three youngest of mm -hmm. the older family were all and you didn't and know Tracy, that. Tracy Dora, and Pete. Oh, yeah, and you didn't know that at that? Not until Kate told oh. me. But she had lots of information because she was one of the oldest ones in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Nice family. And she used to tell about there were so many that had to sleep three in the bed, and Tracy always had to sleep between her and Lena. <laughs> <laughs> she remembered that. Yeah, she remembered that. <laughs> Don't forget that. But. Uh, so that was a dressmaker, and then the, the tablecloth. Yeah, that was made, Mom made that when I was at home. I know I sure had to do an awful lot of dishes alone while she was crocheting that tablecloth, <laughs> because the, we didn't have any electricity and she had to do it all by daylight. She couldn't see well enough with those old koala lamps. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Um, what well, was the I'll pattern on that tablecloth? You know? It was called a bridal. It was cupids and bells oh, and bows. Mm -hmm. It was, she got it out of a, Women's World English magazine. Mm -hmm. Oh, neat. And Nellie Tompkins and he used to give her those old magazines from England. And I've never seen it in any book since. And because when my grandmother, that was my dad's mother, lived in England and she was born in 1847, she said she could remember the town crier coming down the street ringing a bell telling about the war, the Crimean War. And everybody would rush out on the streets to listen to what he said, and then they'd stand around and discuss it afterwards. And then she said, before she was grown up, they had the newspaper come out then. So they were, everybody got their newspaper, and they didn't have the town crier. And they said, these modern times, you know, we don't get to stand out on the street like we used to and discuss all the news after the town crier went, like they used to. And they missed that part, she said. And then she told me that they also only had a fireplace in their house and they didn't have an oven, which they called a cooker in England. So she said they had a big bake oven out in the park and the women used to bake their bread and then take it out to the park and put it in the oven. And they'd sit and do the knitting and all the children would play in the park while they did the knitting. And then when everybody gradually got a cooker, she said they all felt so bad that they missed that socializing out in the park. Isn't that something you mean? With, with the, with the children playing around, and the children missed it too because it was just like a little picnic twice a week or however they had to bake bread. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've ever seen a bake oven, but I know that was an old expression, as hot as a bake oven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Annie Mariah Meek, M-E-E-K Weatherall. That's quite a name, Annie she Mariah. Was she used to say she was meek by name, but not by nature. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> And what was it that your grandpa used to say? Called you the wee? The wee baron. When I was really nice, that was the wee baron. Well, the lads and the, I was just a lassie if I wasn't the wee baron. That was a pet name? Yeah. If you were... He was Scottish origin. Oh. And uh, they lived so near Scotland in northern Yorkshire that I think they all talked about the same. Okay. He had that. Leora asked me if I remember my granddad's Scotch accent. And I said, no, I never 
paid much attention to it. I was used to it, but everybody else used to talk. Mm, yeah. Herman Tracy, Grandma Grand One. Mm -hmm. And they went down to Lethbridge one time. Got their picture taken. Mm -hmm. And where did they live? Well, they lived in Basha at the time, but they went down to visit Kate and Anna Newinger in Lethbridge. And there was a photographer there, and there wasn't one in Mirror Basha at that time. Uh -huh. And most people didn't have cameras until about the 1920s. Or in that era, people started getting having their own camera, and they could take a few snapshots. Otherwise, you've noticed most of them are formal mm -hmm. photographs. But there are quite a few that are casual. I'm surprised that, that there's uh, as many, you know. That one of our old cabin, I don't know who took that one. That mm -hmm. snapshot that somebody mm -hmm. had a cabin. That was pretty unusual at that time. Hmm. And uh, when Tracy Nice, her brother Nice, left home, he went down to Seattle to get a job. And he got a job with the police force in Seattle. And that was the time when they had prohibition and they had a really strong time trying to keep the liquor out of the American. If you can imagine <laughs> prohibition in the States and Canada had liquor. Anyway, this brother, Henry, was killed on duty by some gang or whatever it was. It was kind of hushed up, but he was shot oh. while he was on duty as a policeman. Hmm. And uh, Burton Crown and Rhea were one of the first ones of the cousins, of the second generation, to get married. And we all had quite a f uh, time when they got married. They had a big wedding and all that. And they lived in Lacombe. And then Burton and Rhea moved out here. And he was a heavy duty machine equipment. And he worked on the Anarchist Mountain all while that road was built. All, and they lived in the Suyas. Mm -hmm. So Faye went down, stayed with them, and the, well, they came up here at different times. Do you remember Everett Crown and, mm -hmm. and Bobby and, mm -hmm. and Jean and I know well, they were all in that family. And, and uh, Granddad Lund, in around 1928, was working on a tractor and it had some kind of an open gear in it and he had his gloves on and the glove got wound up in the gear and he got his right hand taken off. And so they had, to, there was no hospital around there so they phoned the doctor and it was on the kitchen table that they operated on his hand and sewed it up. He came to the house? The doctor? Yes, the doc, the, they brought him home in the lumber wagon, the team in the lumber wagon from the field and it's a wonder he didn't bleed to death but anyway he got home and then he phoned the doctor. And they had this all done on the, on the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. The local anesthetic and grandma, I think grandma had to give the chloroform. It was very, very bad. Anyway, the next Sunday after this, all the relatives heard about it and they all came to see her. Grandpa sat on top of looking after him. I had all this bunch of people there, <laughs> relatives from all over, and this is the group of relatives and Grandpa Lund is standing in the back. He still looks quite pale in there. You can find her in the back row in there someplace. I think he's very white. I think Lawrence took the picture. This is So do you want to talk about... And Valentine Nice is on the far end and he is the oldest, one of the older ones in that family and the first one to come up to Alberta before any of the rest of them. They always had to send out a sort of a shooter, whatever you do, <laughs> ahead of time. So he came up and then told the rest of them what it was. So then the Henry Nices all came after that. He stayed in Calgary for a year or two before he moved up to Lamberton. And next to Valentine Nice there is his wife, Julia. They were always known as Aunt Julia and Uncle Valentine. And tell their wedding story. And she, Julia was a waitress in the Lamerton Hotel, which was the biggest hotel in that area at that time, and Lamerton isn't anymore. And he did, did water witching for a living and had cattle and a little farm there. And he used to go to the hotel quite often to eat, and he fell in love with the waitress. And, <laughs> and they lived happily ever afterwards, and they had two daughters, Annie and Frances. And they're generations still 
come out here to visit us, the Browns from Calgary. And uh, we've all remembered from Doris and, and Betty and the rest of them have been out here to visit us. Mm -hmm. And that's their parents. And uh, can you talk a bit more about Valentine and his escapades? Or? Um, he went way up to Prince George and did water witching. And when he wanted to go one time, he didn't have a great deal of money to go on. I don't think Aunt Julia was really anxious for him to go, but anyway, he sold that old brown dresser to Ramelund and a few other things to get enough money to go up to Prince George and water witch from him. That's where the old dresser came from that Bill now owns. It's back in Prince George. <laughs> it's back up in Prince George where it's <laughs> originated <laughs> where he Dora met somebody from Vancouver and they met Pamela, that was her husband's family. They got married and went to Vancouver. And the family still live in Vancouver. And Joseph Penland just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and Catherine phoned me and told me that she'd been out to it. And Dory took her and they drove over the connector so they didn't come down this way. And Joseph Penland just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and Catherine phoned me and told me that she'd been out to it. And Dory took her and they drove over the connector so they didn't come down this way. Before we left Alberta, that was a big separation when Lawrence and Valley moved to Penticton and the rest of them all stayed back. So we had our family picture once again taken before we left. And there was uh, George and Muriel and Richard and Catherine and myself and Lawrence and Grandma and Granddad. And Bubs was on the way. <laughs> and and uh, why did you decide to leave? We, we decided to leave because we had four big girls who were ready, all getting ready for high school, and there was no high school closer than Bashaw or Mir, and I didn't think there was any chance of them being able to get into town to get to school, so I picked up a little fuss and said, well, we were going to move someplace where the girls could go to school after grade eight. So. We decided we'd come out here because Grandma had been out the year before and was worked at Spillers and Granddad. Grandma Lund? Grandma Lund and Granddad came out here to visit. And they both stayed there and helped the Spillers when they first built that house. And then the Grandma came back and told us what a lovely country it was. So we all decided we'd come out to this lovely country. And Lawrence came ahead of time and bought this, this place where we are now. 